So, uh, hi, I'm Alitkin. I'm a vulnerability researcher working on Checkpoint Research Group. Um, in my projects, I usually um, look for vulnerabilities in embedded devices or in network protocols. Um, mostly, you can find my latest research in my Twitter, which works quite well. Um, but working on a specific project is mainly a routine job. But finding the new project to work on is the toughest part. Um, good ideas just don't just fall from the sky. So I have usually a few tips on looking for new research projects. Um, I examine new technologies that just get published because if it's new, less eyes went over it. Maybe we'll find uh, interesting vulnerabilities. Um, going to conferences like this one is a good uh, idea. Last year, uh, Yaniv and I presented a talk about the fax protocol, uh, and the idea for that talk came from Hacklu a few years ago, so it works quite well. Um, but this specific research went from uh, asking friends which software or hardware they usually uh, use, uh, preferably on a daily basis. And specifically for this research, uh, hardware was what I focused on, uh, and more specifically, my dad's camera. And my dad has an expensive camera. I'm not allowed to touch it. Uh, I use it on special occasions to uh, take uh, pictures. And I was intrigued to know, can maybe can I hack into the camera and take over it? So looking on cameras as our idea, and looking about them as a black hat perspective, we can see that first, photography is a very common hobby, at least in Israel. Um, being common means that we have many potential uh, victims we could attack. Um, it's not only common, but cameras are expensive, more specifically the lenses of the cameras, but it's an expensive hobby. Uh, people uh, buy cameras and um, pick the correct camera specific model because it's a high amount to pay, and they treat them with care with special backpacks, and they really uh, want to know that their cameras are safe and protected. And if it's an expensive target, we have a good potential for monetary gain as an attackers. And the last part and the most important part is that people usually uh, take pictures of important things, um, uh, birthdays, a uh, trip abroad, uh, special occasions. So if something will happen to those memories, they'll freak out. Um, they can't have the same birthday again. So it adds drama. And a lot of people with money that don't think clearly are a good target uh, for attackers. So let us just assume that we can take over a target digital camera. Um, what can we do with it? Well, we can break it, but I really don't know why people still do it in 2019. Uh, there is no gain on breaking someone's camera. Uh, we could use this as an espionage tool. It already takes good pictures with high quality. Uh, but the last part is what we're going to focus on, and which is ransomware. If I lock up your camera and encrypt all of your images, would you pay to get the images back? And this is the important question, and we believe that the answer is yes. People will pay to get the cameras back, so let's try to uh, infect them with ransomware and we'll get money uh, in exchange. So this is the goal for our research, and this is where we start. Our target for this specific research is this specific uh, camera model, Canon EOS 80D. Uh, we have nothing against Canon, but we chose this specific model uh, firstly because this specific model supports both USB and Wi-Fi, so you could connect your uh, camera to uh, your computer uh, through USB and get all your images, but you can download them through an app from your mobile phone without any cables. Um, other than that, Canon specifically support uh, controls more than half of the market share. So pretty much everyone that I know of uses uh, Canon cameras, so it was an obvious choice. Um, this was the camera we chose for the specific research, and after we bought it, we found out an additional bonus, and which is Canon has an extensive modding community called Magic Lantern. And if you didn't hear about it before, um, Magic Lanterns and actually some friends, because you have Magic Lantern, 
And you have also CHDK, which stands for Canon Hack Development Kit. And essentially, these are communities that develop a jailbroken version for cameras. So you could add more features, you can uh, resolve bugs that the vendor didn't uh, handle. Um, it's exactly like an, uh, you will have your own jailbroken version for your own camera. So you have both communities that extend the original functionality for the cameras. You have researchers, which research, reverse engineer the hardware and do whatever they can. So you will have an emulated version of your camera on your computer. Some students, uh, if you read through the forums, uh, even say, we don't have enough money to buy our own camera. We only have a software camera in an emulated environment on our computer, because cameras are expensive. The software developers will develop new features, uh, resolve bugs, and will add uh, needed features for the jailbroken versions of the camera. Now, all of these communities are open source, and open source is a great thing. You'll have extensive wiki pages that document how the camera works, uh, how different structures, different functions uh, work, and how we should use them. And we can see through the documentation, this specific example is the function of the operating system that is responsible for spawning new tasks. So we have the name of the function, we know the address of it for each specific camera, we know the arguments, name, priority, stack size, but we don't have all of the information, we have most of it. Because we don't have the official uh, vendor uh, detail, we have community-based information, something will be missing, but it's a very, very good start for research because I don't need to reverse engineer an entire camera, I can uh, rely on the documentation from the community. So it's a gold mine for the research, we simply continue uh, a work that someone already done. Just as a side note, uh, at the time for research, and maybe even today, there is no uh, specific port of Magic Lantern to the EOS ATD camera. And this is mainly because we have some issue with the MMU on this specific hardware model. But why is this important? Um, if you have Magic Lantern installed on your camera, you essentially have a debugger on your camera. There are specific commands added, so you could read RAM, uh, write uh, to RAM, and even execute Lua scripts on your camera. So if you are uh, interested in your camera being secure, and you have Magic Lantern on it, you essentially you have an open debugger extended to the world. Um, we don't have a Magic Lantern port for a camera, so we don't have a debugger either. We have a hardware version, we have documentation, but we won't have a debugger for our risk. So we need to start with some information, but not with all of the tools available. The attack vector we chose for this uh, specific research is PTP. And if you Google up a uh, PTP protocol, you'll find it stands for IEEE 1588, which is the precision time protocol. Um, I can stand here for hours, really, talking about how the master clock sends timestamps to the slave clock and how they elect the grandmaster clock and everything about it because my thesis was about this protocol. But what does it have to do with cameras, right? Um, and it turns out it, it has nothing. Um, PTP is a picture transfer protocol, which makes more sense. And this is the protocol that all of the vendors of the cameras agreed upon on how we communicate with the camera and extract the images to the computer. So essentially it was supposed to only transfer pictures. Um, but you can get the uh, level of your battery, a software version, and do really a lot of things with this specific protocol. It was firstly designed over USB because cameras only had USB. Um, now it also supports PDP over IP because we have Wi-Fi. Um, and it supports a surprisingly high amount of commands. Uh, really, really high amount of commands. Um, even beyond the uh, agreed uh, specs, each vendor has more reserved commands that he implements. So we're going to see in the uh, next few slides we have a really high amount of commands, meaning this will be a good attack vector to look for vulnerabilities. 
Now, there is a firework about this protocol. Um, Daniel Mende gave a talk in uh, Hack in the Box a few years ago called Paparazzi over IP. So we uh, looked upon all of the uh, network protocols that the camera supports and looked for uh, tweaks and quirks he could do to use the camera as an espionage tool. So we looked on the PDP as well. And it really showed that the PDP is a naive network protocol. Uh, it has no security embedded in it. Uh, there's no authentication. There's no encryption. You can simply send messages to the camera, ask for some uh, image, get the image back, and that's it. Uh, you can even send uh, commands to live picture capture. So I can send a command to your camera, tell it to take a picture, and then query back the result of the picture. So it was exactly what he looked for in his talk on paparazzi over IP. We are going to take it one step further. We want to find vulnerabilities in this protocol because we want to hijack the camera and do things that the protocol doesn't support. So if we want to install a ransomware on a camera, we assume that the PDP doesn't support encrypting all of your images, we'll need to uh, take over the camera and find a vulnerability for that. So this is the goal for our specific focus. So we need to analyze the film. Analyzing the firmware was a classic case. You go to the vendor's website, you download the firmware update file called .fir, which probably stands for firmware, and you download it from the website, you open it in your favorite uh, binary editor, and you see a problem. Uh, we have an even byte distribution uh, throughout the file, with, which means that every byte, we can see each byte the same amount of times, and this leads us to, uh, to guess that Either it's uh, encrypted or it is uh, compressed. And even if it's compressed, it's a pretty good compression. So we don't have a plain text firmware just from the vendor's website. We need to bypass some layer. And what Magic Lantern say about this? They have a uh, wiki documentation. And we saw that Magic Lantern say it is, in, the, in fact, encrypted. It's AS encrypted. We don't have the key. So we can't simply analyze the firmware. Um, at this point, friends told me, okay, um, Google up the key. You'll find the key in Google uh, most probably, and that's it. Uh, it works in many uh, research projects, uh, but it didn't work this time. Uh, it turns out there's no key um, available offline, uh, online. Um, so we're stuck. Uh, we don't have a key. We have an encrypted firmware. Well, we can't continue on on the research. Uh, it looks like a dead end. Um, but we have a camera. Uh, we can think about, okay, somehow dump the film from our own camera, but it's an expensive camera. We don't want to break it or open it. Um, how did Magic Lantern did their work? Because they had the same problem as we did. Um, and it turned out they already had a solution called ROM Dumper. Uh, ROM Dumper is a proprietary firmware update that Magic Lantern uh, compiled and distributed on their website. So uh, if you have a camera, you can load it to your SD card, tell the camera to update the firmware, and it will dump the entire memory to the SD card. They need it because many developers will be able to analyze this ROM and uh, work on your camera. How did they distribute such a firmware update? Well, they had the keys. Uh, they extracted the keys on their own. Uh, we don't need to do it on our own. Um, we can use the ROM dumper. We don't need any hardware support. And it works quite well. So we have this uh, mag uh, magic uh, lantern for the rescue. Firmware update, we get all of the RAM to the SD card. We can simply load the content to our favorite uh, disassembler and continue on with the research. We don't need to analyze the firmware update. We can analyze our exact camera and that's it. So we had to load it into IDA. Um, specifically, I prefer to use IDA and they actually have instructions on how to load it to IDA, which kernel options to use. So we thought about everything. And it worked quite well. We verified basic functions, again, the documentation in the wiki pages. The memcopy was in the same place, so it worked quite well. But we have one catch, and this is 
Our specific camera uses an ARM uh, CPU, a 32-bit Little Indian ARM CPU, and the uh, analysis that IDA performs on ARM binaries is not perfect. Um, usually, I need to manually improve the analysis before I could start the research because it doesn't analyze correctly many functions, transitions between uh, thumb and ARM, so I had to do it manually. Luckily enough, you don't. Okay, so we have a script to do it. You don't have to do it manually anymore. Uh, we call this IDA plugin Thumbs Up. Thumbs Up is basically an IDA plugin that uses really, really, really basic machine learning uh, to learn how functions should appear and then mark them. So you can read all about it in our blog post. Uh, it's already released on our GitHub account. Um, it will analyze the firmware for us and uh, improve the analysis of IDA. It was first uh, developed as a pre-process phase for an additional IDA plugin called Carda, which we presented last year here in the, uh, as a lightning talk, uh, which we use to match open sources that were compiled statically into the binary. Just as an example, before we started the analysis, uh, this is how the memory looked like. All of the uh, yellow or orange rectangles are functions, and the brown rectangles are code sections which are, have no functions. Ida couldn't find any functions in them. And we can see we have many, many brown rectangles uh, spread throughout the memory. After we execute thumbs up, it looks like this. So we can really, really work on it now. We have 10,000 more functions to work on. It really improves the analysis on this specific case. Um, now we can work and search for vulnerabilities. The operating system. The operating system is called ViOS, so you've probably never heard about it. Uh, it's a proprietary real-time operating system uh, developed by the vendor. And I'll repeat that. Canon developed their own real-time operating system just for their cameras. So you don't see that a lot. Um, it has its uh, bonuses, but from our perspective, it's a real-time operating system. We have no separation of privileges, no user mode or kernel mode. If you execute code over one task, you won. No, nothing uh, to bypass. So Canon de developed their own operating system, but from our perspective, is just like any other uh, artist out there. It has one significant uh, bonus, which is the camera reboots in three seconds. Not one minute, not two minutes, not one hour, three seconds. And it will be really, really useful because when we debug our exploit, which never works on the first attempt, we need to wait three seconds and then we can try again. Uh, on the previous research, we had to wait seven minutes. On previous research projects, they had to wait even 20 minutes before between iterations, now we wait three seconds. So it's, it, it shortened up the research quite a lot. Um, that's a major advantage for this operating system, uh, and it's a major advantage if you have a camera. It reboots really fast. Time to break up the protocol itself. The first phase is we need to find the vulnerable uh, code model. If we want to find vulnerabilities in PDP, we need to find the firmware uh, responsible for the PDP. And the PDP protocol is command-based. I send requests to the camera, and I get response back. Uh, each command will have its own unique identifier or opcode of 16 bits, which means that if I send a request for information to the camera, it will be a specific opcode. And thanks to an anonymous .NET programmer, uh, which leaked all of the code from Canon SDK, uh, we have it all on Google. And we can see part of the list, we have open session and closed session, get device info. We have something called an object, so we can delete, delete an object, create, create an object, apparently. That's from the SDK. So we have a unique opcode for each command, and we can simply search for the opcodes in memory. Uh, and it worked quite well. Uh, we found a massive function with a unique code pattern we can see on the screen. Um, we have the command for get device info or open session and close session. And each time we get the opcode into R0, which is the first argument of the function, R1 will get something that looks like a function pointer. And R2 is zero because probably it's an optional field that no one really uses. So 
this specific function is probably responsible for registering a PDP handler and mapping it for the specific opcode. So we now have a complete mapping between each supported opcode and the function pointer that handles it. And we verified it as a sanity check, and we saw that indeed the opcode for open session really maps to the function that has the strings inside it saying PTP open session. So uh, it was easy to check. If you're a vendor, don't use so many trace strings in your firmware. It really helps me. Uh, almost every PTP handler has a string with its name inside it. Some have typos, and some ha uh, you, we can see over were copy-pasted because we have the same string in multiple handlers, so they implemented them by copy-pasting, and they didn't change the string. But it's a really useful information when reverse engineering this specific firmware. Um, up in total, we have really, really a high amount of handlers. We have 138 different command handlers just for getting pictures from the camera. Uh, actually, we have more handlers because some are duplicate for some reason, so we have multiple opcodes for the same functionality. We have one hundred. Roughly 150 unique handlers. Um, the rule of thumb is one to 10. For 10 handlers, we'll find one critical vulnerability. So we hope to find critical vulnerabilities. Uh, the odds are in our favor. Um, it looks promising. Now we need to understand the API. Since we have a specific function that registers each handler, each, uh, all of the handlers adhere to the same uh, API. The API says that each function uh, will get up to five arguments. Um, there all will be 32-bit integer types. Some handlers could get more uh, data. You can send a data buffer with your message. Uh, but most of them will only use the arguments because you just need to query information from the camera, not send information to the camera. And each handler will use a specific struct, what was partially uh, documented, called PDP context. And the PDP context will use function pointers for it to work. So we had a documentation for Magic Lantern, so the code made sense. Otherwise, we only had function pointers without any name, and the code will look like gibberish. So we have all of the uh, handlers, and although we started with nearly 150, um, only 38 handlers receive data. You know, we have more chances of finding vulnerabilities when actually parsing a data buffer that we send as attackers. So we are going to focus only on this subset of commands, but the rule of thumb was one to 10. So we expect to find roughly four critical vulnerabilities. It should be okay. It was a massive reduction. We live with it. Um, I could fuzz all of the handlers and find vulnerabilities, but when the camera crashes, you need to physically move a switch to power it on, and I don't have any cool robotics uh, group that will develop something that will reboot the camera each line. And additionally, sometimes when the camera crashes, you need to uh, get out, uh, you need to plug out the battery and reinstall it again, and that's really complicated as a robotic arm, so we couldn't really fuzz it, and actually the camera crashes quite a lot. So uh, you won't get anything from a crash, if, even if you connected your camera to um, your computer by USB and communicated with uh, an open source for communicating with your camera, most probably it will crash. If It will not crash only if you use the specific vendor uh, program, and that's because they, I don't know, they have a lot of bugs. Um, it will crash, fuzzing won't get us anywhere. We need to use good old uh, code audit, manually analyze all of the specific handlers, look for vulnerabilities, hope to find fast enough shallow vulnerabilities and get it over with. And it worked, it worked quite well. Um, uh, a shallow scan throughout all of the 38 uh, handlers produced three remote code execution candidates. Um, we have here the CVEs, we have a buffer overflow over the global variables, a buffer overflow over the stack, a buffer overflow over the heap, so we, you can pick your weapon of choice. Um, two of the vulnerabilities are in Bluetooth. Bluetooth-related commands, which is high-tech. Um, the camera doesn't support Bluetooth. I'm not complaining, they have vulnerabilities in a feature they didn't implement. Um, we found out that 
there are cameras that support Bluetooth, but not our specific model, and they probably don't if they out the code. So as a tip to vendors, if you didn't ship the feature, move it out from the firmware. No, don't <laughs> ship it. So we actually exploited vulnerabilities in a feature that didn't exist, um, which worked quite well. Um, we are going to focus on the stack-based buffer overflow because it's easiest to uh, exploit. So now we have to uh, exploit a vulnerability. This is a clean up modified code version for the vulnerability. We can see that the first we start with a querying for the input size of the attacker's packet, storing it in uh, input size. They use a local stack buffer of fixed size and then they receive the input from my packet using my size into the fixed buffer. So they don't have any check that the buffer is big enough for my packet and it's a classic buffer overflow over the stack, nothing uh, interesting. But we do have to remember that even if we have a buffer overflow, uh, we didn't win at, uh, instantly. We need to get back from this function and then the uh, overflow return address will be controlled and we'll, we'll, we will win. But before we return from the function, we have some function pointer. I didn't, I didn't know which uh, was it. It's a mystery callback. We don't know who calls it, why, what does it do. Uh, we can see it. We hope that the camera works, so it will return safely from the function, but we don't know. So um, we store it aside, we'll get back to it later. Now we have a mystery callback and we hope for good. Uh, bidding the exploit um, wasn't easy. We don't have a debugger for the camera. We have a black box, a nice black box, you can see, but we don't have any debugger for the camera. So in such cases, I usually use a specific technique, uh, which I refer to as sleep-based debugging. Uh, it's quite easy to find a function that's responsible for sleep somewhere in the Android space, and then you can embed calls to sleep inside your exploit. So you can trace a call to sleep five, one, two, uh, whatever you can visibly see, and then you start the exploit, wait with a timer, and check what happened. If it crashed after five seconds, uh, you reach your breakpoint. If it crashed immediately, you didn't reach your breakpoint. So you can move around the call to sleep, and you can see when did the exploit crashed, and then you'll know roughly uh, where did you have a problem in your exploit. So it works quite well, but we, you need to distinguish between a delay, the sleep, and a crash. So how do IoT devices crash? On a Windows kernel, we'll see a blue screen of death when you crash. Uh, it turns out that in many IoT devices, it looks roughly the same. So on the fax research from the previous year, we saw this nice blue screen on HP's uh, printer. Uh, on Canon's camera, we'll see arrow 70. Um, even saying as sometimes you need to uh, plug out the battery and reinstall it again. Sometimes we get error 80 for some reason. I don't know what's the difference between error 70 and error 80, but error 80 is much more severe, and sometimes the camera gets stuck. So we want to get see error 70. After you, after you see it, you reboot the camera, and you try again your exploit after you found the bug and fixed it. So it works quite good on paper. Uh, only on paper. Actually, the camera tends to hang instead of crash. Uh, we don't know why, but um, I can't distinguish between sleep five seconds and hang forever and just hang forever. So I can't see the breakpoint. It makes no sense to use uh, this specific breakpoint, meaning that we need a new technique. Uh, our goal was some event we could distinguish so we could see that an event occurred. Um, we decided to switch tactics, and instead of sleeping and then crashing, crashing on purpose. So if we'll find a specific address that always crashes the camera, a crash will mean we reach a breakpoint, and nothing means we didn't reach a breakpoint. Uh, okay, so finding an address that always crashes the camera should be easy, right? We just called address zero. It hangs. So we call the address one. And it hangs. So we call the address minus one. 
and it hangs. Uh, and a few hours later, and just randomly selecting addresses, I found this address, and it crashes the camera. So it was random guess. Uh, I don't know what's in this specific address, but if you call this specific address, the camera will crash. So uh, now we could uh, use this as our breakpoint. So if we saw nothing, uh, we didn't reach the breakpoint. If we crashed, we saw a breakpoint. Essentially, we're doing this experiment. We were telling to Coyote to get to the end of the tunnel. If he crashed into the mountain, we saw a breakpoint. If he didn't get to the mountain, um, we had a problem. And we can move the mountain on and off. And it worked quite well. So uh, now we have an exploit. It worked. It's a crash-based debugging. Um, usually at this phase, I load up a debugger so I could uh, dynamically reverse engineer the embedded device. So my, my weapon of choice is a Scout debugger. Um, we have links to it on GitHub on uh, next slides. Um, just as a note, until now I use PDP over USB because it's much easier than actually configuring an IP address for your camera on a digital screen. So uh, I use PDP over USB, but Scout is using uh, TCP. So uh, the TCP failed, and then I had to debug my debugger and find out that the camera can't use USB and Wi-Fi at the same time. If you have USB, it should be used for PDP and that's it. If you have Wi-Fi, it should be used for PDP and that's it. So it makes no sense to use both USB and Wi-Fi at the same time. So we have Scout running inside the camera, but we can't reach it. It can't contact back home, our laptop, and we are stuck. So we have a debugger, but we can't reach it. Time to migrate to Wi-Fi, hoping everything will work, and we'll have a debugger uh, working and deployed. Um, up until now, we used the uh, PTPy. Um, it's here on GitHub. Uh, it's an open source. It worked quite well. It's just like any other open source. It really didn't work out of the box, but it was way better than, than nothing. They say they support uh, PTP over IP. They didn't implement this feature, so we implemented this feature. Now it supports Wi-Fi. We sent basic messages to the camera. We see it works. Now we hope that the exploit will simply work as is, because we have a vulnerability in the applicative layer of PTP, and it should, really shouldn't care if it's over Wi-Fi over, or over USB. We have separation of layers. It should work. Uh, and, right, it should work. Um, no, nothing really works. Um, the vulnerability was in a Bluetooth-related message. We had a mystery callback, and now it seems that this callback hangs. So instead of executing code, the camera hangs again, and we really think it's just simply guesswork, but the Wi-Fi system and chip hangs when we remind him it doesn't support Bluetooth, and when he's off because of USB, it doesn't care. So essentially, we're stuck in this phase. Um, the vulnerability isn't exploitable over Wi-Fi. We'll need to find new vulnerabilities. At the first scan, we had a shallow scan, and we identified only shallow bugs. Maybe we missed a few. Uh, and we hope we'll find additional vulnerabilities we could exploit over Wi-Fi. And actually, we found two more uh, of the same nature. We have the same code pattern. I, I send a message. It has a size. We actually check my size. Again, the fixed known size before they process the packet. If they have a mismatch, they log for error. And that's it. Um, they don't drop a malicious packet. We simply log it and continue on. And we tested it because it's only a debug printf. It's not a trace and crash or anything like it. So you send a message. They say we are attacked. And then they are attacked because they do nothing with the message. And that's why we missed it on the first scan. So we found uh, two such vulnerabilities. We simply modified the exploit. And that's it. So as a recap, we have five vulnerable PTP handlers. Uh, all POCs worked over USB. And only three of them worked over Wi-Fi, so the next time someone tells you it's an exploitable vulnerability, trust me, it's not. If you don't have a POC, it's not exploitable. Um, but we didn't uh, demonstrate uh, code execution over USB and over Wi-Fi, and now we're done, right? Um, we executed code over the camera. Um, we didn't. Our goal was to develop a ransomware. So 
we need to develop ransomware. And a phrase I like to use is that attackers are profit maximizers, which is a really good statement for I am lazy. And this means that I should develop a ransomware, I want to develop a ransomware, but I really don't want to implement my own crypto for the ransomware because that's tedious. So uh, people usually say, don't invent your own crypto. You can steal it from someone else. So Canon already have crypto in the firmware update. We can simply call their own functions. Uh, so we need to find out where are the functions in the firmware and how do they work and simply call these routines instead of implementing our own crypto. So it's time to dig on crypto functions. <coughs> The design of the firmware update is quite easy on paper. Um, everything is symmetric. They use AES, it's a symmetric crypto uh, implementation. And this means there is a single key for signing the firmware update and for verifying it. The camera needs to verify the firmware update, so the camera also has the key for signing it. There's a different key for decrypting the firmware update, but you can use the same key for encrypting a new update of your choice, so that's nice. And you have symmetric um, signature, HMAC, which everything here is symmetric. When we search for the crypto functions, we actually found the keys that the vendor uses. Um, so we can simply use the keys to sign everything we want and send it as a firmware update of our own, which is quite neat. So let's understand exactly how it works. We'll really try to you to find out how it works, but Ida couldn't figure that out. Ida can't even decompile some of the functions. So I have multiple crypto functions with assembly snippets inside them in the decompiler. And essentially, according to Wikipedia, it looks like a OFB mode of operation. Uh, it really looks like it. Uh, it doesn't work against Python. So the uh, code of the camera and Python don't agree on the results. Um, we really couldn't implement it on our own in Python to have a script for sign a new firmware update or anything like it. It simply didn't work, and it was quite ugly. So instead, we thought about a new technique. We already have a debugger. I implemented a new instruction for the debugger to calculate the crypto on its own. So we don't need to understand everything. We can simply call the function of the vendor inside the camera itself. We use it as a... We call it um, an extended CPU, which has crypto capabilities. You tell the uh, debugger to encrypt, it encrypts, and that's it. We simply call the function from the firmware. Uh, it was quite usual when we had to test the firmware uh, update with the patch from the vendor because they sent us an encrypted file, and that's it. And we had to decrypt the file on our own so we could patch the, uh, check the patch and see that they fixed the vulnerabilities correctly. Uh, we didn't get anything other. So the camera will calculate the correct signature. The camera is uh, also uh, able to encrypt and decrypt firmware updates, which brings us to this attack scenario. We already have a compromised camera on our home. So we take the firmware update, we send it to the camera. The camera will decrypt the firmware update. And now we have a plain firmware update. We can do whatever we like with. We install a backdoor, we insert everything we want, we send it back to the camera, the camera will encrypt it, will sign it, and now we have a malicious firmware update we can simply distribute. And this CV is for, if we take this malicious update, simply send it to our target camera, over the air, nothing special, and actually without any user interaction, we just updated the firmware for our target without any consent. So you simply send a packet to the target camera, and it happily updates the firmware and that's it. And now you can take over a camera without any vulnerabilities, just by using the keys. So we tested it with uh, Magic Lantern's ROM dumper and it worked. So now we have a checkpoint research ROM dumper and they can actually had to fix this uh, vulnerability in addition to of the implementation vulnerabilities. So design issues are important as well. Just to connect the dots, uh, once we finished playing around with the firmware update, we actually had to implement the ransomware. So uh, I implemented the logic to uh, encrypt uh, all of the images on the SD card, and that's the time for a demo.
So we have my laptop and the camera without any cables or anything like it. And you can see that the camera actually works. It's not rigged or anything. So we can take a picture. It works. We actually have three pictures on the camera at this point. And now it's time to start the attack. So we start the extra script for my computer. Everything here is over Wi-Fi. We have no cables. It takes some time. And now we can see the LED on the camera indicating multiple writes to the SD card because it's now encrypting all of the images. After it finishes the encryption, we show a ransom message to the user. So we've now encrypted the camera. <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, responsible disclosure, because we worked with Canon to fix all of the issues. Uh, we reported all of the vulnerabilities to Canon this year, and we worked quite close with them uh, to patch everything. Uh, Canon confirmed all of the vulnerabilities, issued CVs, patched them all, we tested all of the uh, fixes, and they are good. Uh, full details and advisory from the vendor in English and in Japanese. Uh, you can find all of the links in our, blo in our blog post. And just as a side note, uh, we found the keys for the firmware update and we deleted them. Um, don't ask me for the keys, I won't send them. If the keys will get published, Magic Lantern will need to work hard to extract new keys. So I deleted the keys, don't email me anything about the keys. Conclusions. Um, we found many vulnerabilities in PTP, and actually we looked for vulnerabilities only this specific model, and really didn't look for additional vulnerabilities in the camera. Um, we found many vulnerabilities. They might also apply to other vendors. Maybe the same vulnerabilities, maybe a, a bit different. But we found five critical vulnerabilities and one design uh, vulnerability in something that only should give you pictures from the camera. So most probably other vendors have similar vulnerabilities in their cameras as well. The PDP protocol has no security. Uh, anybody could simply connect to your camera over Wi-Fi and send uh, commands to it. Um, maybe it should have a new version, security, authentication, encryption, anything like it. And the last point is, Canon implemented a proprietary key derivation in their crypto. Um, it, it really didn't add any mathematical strength, and it really didn't add any meaningful obscurity, because we simply called their function. So adding obscurity won't add security to your uh, product. There's no reason to do that. And the tools I used throughout the research are available on a GitHub account. So um, I mentioned Carda earlier. It's an IDA plugin for matching open sources that were statically compiled into your firmware. In this case, Canon didn't use any open source, so we found none. Um, Carda contains a thumbs up, which is the machine learning for improving the IDA analysis. And the debugger I used is Scout. It's an embedded instruction-based debugger I de I've developed. It worked quite well on, on the fax research and uh, this research as well. So these are the tools. If you have issues, extension you want, send a pull request, open an issue, and I'll work over it. So get free to use the tools. Uh, it's on GitHub, and that's it. Thank you for coming. OK. Thank you yeah, again. Uh, any any questions? Yep. Small question. How much time did it take you from the first analysis so to find the vulnerable uh, vulnerabilities till to do the malware? Um, we have a detailed. Um, research log for each research we uh, conduct. So we know how many work days, not calendar days, but work days it took. So starting the analysis, loading up to IDA and finding the first vulnerability took four days. And finishing up all of the research, including the exploit demo and everything, took 25 work days. So it was quite a short research in amount of time because uh, debugging the exploit was really fast uh, because it reboots fast. Uh, we had a lot of information from the wiki pages. Uh, the vulnerabilities were really easy to spot. 
Um, and we already have the debugger from the previous research project. So we invested time in developing it, and now it works on uh, additional research projects. So it was quite a fast result. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, short comment and a question. Um, I doubt that PTP will ever have authentication because it's supposed to be a USB protocol. And as far as I know, uh, at least from from the paparazzi talk, uh, Canon just put it over TCP. Yeah, um, they, they can't really add authentication. We need to yeah. really redesign the protocol. And I really don't think that the camera vendors actually thought of security when designing the protocol. And I really don't think that they will add authentication now. But vendors really should think about it when first designing the protocol. Because this protocol isn't that old, but it really looks like ARP or something that was designed decades ago without security in mind. Yeah, PTP is a USB protocol, so as far as I know. PTP and was designed to work over USB, but when we saw the PTP context in the firmware, it had yeah. function pointers because it had function pointers for the transport layer. So it, we simply changed the function handlers for Wi-Fi instead of for USB, and it really isn't uh, such a large modification because the layers shouldn't be really connected if you designed it properly. So it could work over Wi-Fi, and w when on Wi-Fi, add authentication. You probably don't need authentication over USB because it's your computer. But if you uh, connect your camera to a Wi-Fi in a tourist attraction, then uh, I can connect to your camera for the same Wi-Fi and exploit it, J just the same as you can connect to your camera and take out your pictures. So on Wi-Fi, they can add additions, but I really don't think we'll do that. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, um, the question, since you have been fuzzing uh, PTP, did you look at other implementations since a lot of other media devices, including Android, also use um, PTP? I looked on some of the code in Android and didn't find anything uh, important. Um, we really didn't build a fuzzle because the camera crashes quite a lot. It actually crashed before I started sending the correct packet for the PUC. Um, when you connect uh, PTPi to the camera, PTPi sends the same get device info message twice because it, for some reason, forgets. So sending the same message twice to a Canon uh, camera will crash it. Um, so it crashed immediately without any fuzzle. Um, the barrier for buying new cameras or extracting the firmware and analyzing the PDP model for uh, additional vendors is quite high because you need to buy a camera in $1,000 each. So we worked on this specific model. We didn't get PDP models of other vendors. We believe they have vulnerabilities. If they want our help to find them, we'll happily uh, help. Um, but we really didn't test it. So it's a future work. Other researchers could do it. Uh, they'll probably find one of them. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, more questions? Okay. Hi, I'm Trevor Hudson, the author of Magic Lantern, and I have a, a lot of concern with the framing of this, that it's a very negative uh, use rather than focusing on the positive aspects of jailbreaking. And are you concerned that this is going to attract the wrong attention from Canon towards the modding community? You know, over the past 10 years, we've had they've basically ignored us and allowed us to focus on creating better cameras for uh, for the camera owners and for the users? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I talked with Alex uh, about it from um, one of the major researchers in Magic Lantern. Um, I don't have anything against Magic Lantern. It's a really great community with great documentation, and a lot of people buy Canon cameras specifically because they could install Magic Lantern on them. Um, and I actually... 
sent some of the details from our research, uh, useful functions we found in the firmware and anything like it, to the developers of Magic Lantern, so it could help them uh, developing the report for this specific camera, if it will help. Um, the attitude we get from the vendor while working on it uh, was that um, they really want to fix the vulnerabilities we found. Uh, we didn't get any response about, uh, they saw all the slides, they saw the blog post, they didn't say anything about uh, the communities of Magic Lantern or CHDK, and they didn't respond back to Magic Lantern that they really feel that might get kicked out of the cameras because the vendor won't like it. It looks like the status quo will remain. So there will be jailbroken versions for the camera. It's a good thing. A lot of people buy cameras for this. Canon knows that they buy cameras because of this reason. I don't really think Canon will have any reason to do something active to prevent that. Um, actually, from my perspective, the documentation was so good that this research took roughly one month when the facts research took on and off two years. So it was way easier to uh, work on it. Uh, it. It means the work was with good quality. Um, I really hope that the, those communities for the versions of the film of the cameras will continue on. A lot of people use them. Currently, they have a hardware issue with the MMU and additional uh, protections. Uh, I don't. I really hope that it will remain as is and nothing will change. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Room. Okay. Thanks again for the talk. Oh, one there. Sorry. Hello. Uh, Hi. The address that you mentioned that it will be crashed all the time. Did you try it also with another device and you find the same uh, address? Um, this specific address? Yes. Uh, whenever I called it, it crashed the camera. I don't know what's specific about this address, what happens, because I didn't have a debugger to test it, but that was the initial problem. Um, what happened with, with another device, for example? Is it still the same address? Um, because I don't think so. It's a really low address. I really believe it's something to do with the bootloader, uh, which really doesn't change a lot in uh, other firmware versions, uh, but I really don't know because I had, I had two cameras, but of the same version because we had to test the pets of the vendor. Um, it didn't get lock, get locked out of your camera before you filmed the demo. So we had two cameras, but on the, the same model, and my dad didn't let me to test it on his camera. Um, <laughs> it's a good decision. Um, I really don't know, uh, but it was random guesswork, and it works. So if it won't work for you on uh, on your camera, guess another address, and eventually it will work. Nothing magical about it. Uh, just as a side note, Canon gradually uh, released the filmers, the patched filmers, on their website. Uh, they didn't do it uh, all at once. So the versions for the EOS ATD are already on the site from August. Uh, 5D Mark something is uh, two weeks or three weeks on the website. And if your camera isn't patched yet, uh, stay tuned, watch the website. We get uh, the film was released. I helped my dad patch his own camera. So uh, eventually they get everything out. The updates is uh, working. Did you check it? We verified the, the fixes. The fixes close all of the vulnerabilities. If you use the patched versions, you're protected from all of the vulnerabilities I've shown in this talk. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have shown them. Thank you very much. So, uh, okay, so um, thank you again for the talk.